My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Omar and Leslie, for this beautiful introduction. Um, you know, I didn't prepare a speech. I don't like to prepare such things. Um, but I prepared some images that I would like to share with you. And I thought I just speak freely as the ideas and as the heart wants to speak. And, and to have a focus maybe on these uh, three words, remembering, necessary, and ceremony, which I think very much define the work that I've been doing. I thought to start from the beginning as you are in New York and to start with, um, with this solo exhibition, Erin's Birds and Monsters, that is currently at the beautiful um, Amand Art Foundation in Brooklyn. And in one of the rooms, um, you will be guided to this um, trilogy uh, called, titled, A World of Illusions. And I think um, there's a continuity in the work um, that starts with the story of Narcissus, from the story of Narcissus to uh, Oedipus, from Oedipus to Antigone, to this uh, most recent work, uh, Ubarco, The Boat. And I would like to go through these four works. Um, uh, we, Cho chose the title Remembering is a Necessary Ceremony because I think a large part of my words um, is about remembering um, as an opposition to forgetting. And as I work very much with uh, the theory of memory and with this um, dialectic between memory and forgetting, um, knowing that memory is actually um, a theory of forgetting. And that sometimes it seems like we are dealing with the past, but the past coincides with the present, just like memory coincides with the forgetting. One cannot forget history and one cannot avoid remembering it. And this dialectic between memory and forgetting um, past and present uh, is very much present in my work. Um, I'm very concerned with this politics of erasure, um, with, with the conscious and the unconscious, the visible and the invisible, um, with what we see and what we do not see, or what we see and what we do not want to see, uh, what we know and what we do not know. And in this sense, I like very much this idea of creating a, a, a matrix, a time, a, a scenario of timelessness, where then the present and the past and the future become one, one, one unique space, one in one moment. So for this trilogy, um, I worked with uh, this. Uh, wide space, this wide cube that um, can be seen really as a, as a matrix, a futuristic matrix, where uh, actors enter to tell stories anew and to tell stories that usually we know them quite well, um, but that apparently need to be revised the perspective, how we read them. And I, I, with this project, I went to the most um, famous and most uh, known classical uh, mythology, the Greek mythology, and looked at Narcissus, Oedipus, and, um, and Antigna to read it through a post-colonial lens. So what you see in these three uh, storytellings, in these three volumes, is actually the restaging of what we apparently know. And then, a new reading, a new gaze into the story and into the many different layers of the story that actually help us to understand the post-colonial um, tragedies and conflicts. 
So um, the story of Narcissus becomes actually a story of, um, of the politics of misrepresentation and invincibility. Narcissus is a character who is so much in love with himself and ignores all the others around him that the gods come to punish him and, um, and decide that he will fall in love with someone that uh, can never love him back. And indeed he falls in love with his own image when he looks uh, in a lake and he sees himself, he falls in love with himself. Um, and this is a, met a me metaphor for this post-colonial society that is concerned and obsessed with the reproduction of um, a dominant and a normative uh, identity um, and sees itself as the ideal object of love and ignores all and invisibilizes all the other identities. So this is what, the, what is told in the first volume. You see here in a little vertical box, um, the performance of the storyteller uh, where I sit and read page by page the script that I wrote and that I staged in a large, uh, in a large um, projection. And here I wanted to work with this, um, with this uh, practice of knowledge production of the Creole, of this uh, African tradition of storytelling, the Creole, the woman who comes to tell the stories anew, a woman whose body is like a living archive of knowledge and of memories, and apparently brings, brings the knowledge again that was forgotten, but always gives a twist to what it seemed that we knew and brings a new um, reading of history. Um, and this is what happens at Amant Art Foundation in this large room where the three stories are told. From the story of Narcissus, I came to the story of uh, Oedipus. And the story of Oedipus usually has been seen as a story of desire, a story of, of, um, of, um, of a sexual desire and identity. And what I wanted to explore in this story was actually what Franz Fanon um, very shortly in his book, uh, Black Skin, White Masks mentioned about the Oedipus complex and the performance of violence. So the entire volume uh, of Illusions to, um, of the day dedicated to Oedipus is actually dedicated to the politics of violence and the politics of genocide. The story of Oedipus is a very tragic uh, story like all the Greek mythologies or old mythologies, which fascinates me very much, this human tragedies because it brings to question um, very, very uh, profound decisions that humans have to uh, do um, and to call their humanity and to be aware of what the human condition is. And the Oedipus, the story of Oedipus is as well a very tra a, a tragic story that begins with a child that is cursed to death even before being born. And um, you know, the father who feels who is in competition with the child and sees the child as a, a rival, um, decides that the child should be killed after the birth. So the entire story um, deals with, um, with questions of death, questions of abandonment, of loyalty, um, and uh, comes a very important character, uh, which is the Sphinx, who comes, who is here. Um, the Sphinx appears in the, and is sent by the gods again um, to, to look upon the city and to ask a question, a riddle, that everybody um, is to be asked and she is waiting for an answer. Um, the riddle is a very simple riddle. She asks something like, 
what is it that in the morning has, what is the being that in the morning has four uh, legs, in the afternoon has two legs, and in the evening has three legs. And those who are not able to solve the riddle or to give an answer are killed by this uh, entity who's a kind of a monster, is a is an hybrid body with wings like a bird and, and the body of a lion and the face of a woman. Um, but she asks this question because metaphorically she's asked, she was put, sent to the city because something terrible happened in the past, a genocide took place and several deaths. And she's sent by the gods because she, she acts a little bit like the super eagle who comes to ask who knows its history. And those who do not know the history will be devoured by the Sphinx. And this is a function. So she asks this riddle in the expectation of having um, an answer. And only when the answer is there, the city is free. Of course, it is Oedipus, who's the first one who can answer and can liberate the city. And the answer is very simple. He answers, it is a human being. It is a human being who is in constant process, who is born with four uh, and walks in four um, uh, legs, becomes an adult and walks in two legs and becomes then an elder and has three legs with the help of the stick. But what he's mentioning is, again, recalling us what is the human condition. While the entity is reminding uh, Oedipus uh, and reminding us, all of us, that we cannot escape our destiny as well as we cannot escape history. We have to know our history. So I thought, uh, when staging this entire story to focus exactly on this politics of um, violence and genocide, um, to understand what the Oedipus complex is in a post-colonial context. And then this guided me to, um, to the story of Antigona. And the story of Antigona then brings a third dimension into it, which is the importance of ceremony. Um, ceremony and ritual, um, which is something very performative and the performance and the theater and the choreography are always present in my works. So I'm very interested. I really start all my works with writing with a lot of sound analysis. And once I wrote the script and the work and did all the research, I start drawing a storyboard with scenes and uh, with sculptures, human sculptures of how to stage the human conflicts. Um, and this is this a process. And once the images are there, then I work with actors. I perform myself as well with an ensemble of actors. And um, there's movement and choreography and music uh, for the illusions, for a world of illusions, for all the trilogy. I worked with um, Neil Moyano, who was a South African uh, opera composer um, for the boat, uh, for instance. Then I worked with uh, Kalafe Palanga, who's an Angolan uh, music product producer. So um, music is always very present as well as movement and choreography. Um, and that really fascinates me to bring texts and these very political texts and very um, tragic and very psychoanalytical texts into image and into staging, which somehow makes sense because the language of psychoanalysis is the language of unconscious. So we work a lot with, with um, metaphors and associations and, 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 and images. Um, so the translation from one to the other becomes um, a very logical one. 
Um, so for Antigone, Antigone brought uh, again another question for me. Um, it was not simply a question, a, a story, a feminist story um, of a woman who challenges the King Creon by wanting to, to bury the brother. Um, I wanted to go a little bit beyond that, um, that usual reading of Antigona, and I wanted to explore uh, the question of uh, ritual and ceremony. And I was very concerned with the fact that Antigona had two brothers who were killed. They killed each other in a fight for power. And, um, and in this uh, moment, uh, one was allowed after the death, one was allowed to be buried uh, because he was in alliance with the king and the other brother was not allowed to be uh, buried because he was against the system of the King Creon. And what King Creon declared was that nobody was allowed to bury this second brother. He had to be uh, left on the ground for, as food for dogs and birds. And Antigna brings a very important question, which was um, both were a brothers, and of course a heart speaks, wants to bury the second brother as well. And uh, the king does not allow, and those who disobey him would uh, be sentenced to death. And the question of an, that Antigna brings is that um, what she re responds to the king is that the king is just another man and each man creates their own law and she cannot obey the, the laws of a man. She has to obey the law of humanity and the laws of the gods. Um, and in this sense, she is restaging um, the human condition. She buries a brother and uh, she's sentenced to death and she dies. But she brings a very important topic for me, a very important question, which is the need of King Creon not to allow her to bury a brother because a brother who was opposing the system, the political system was supposed to be forgotten. And when he's forgotten, she cannot produce memory. And I was very concerned with this politics of erasure, how ceremony and rituals and the erasure of ceremony and rituals was politically used as a way to erase memory and not in order not to produce memory. And when you do not produce memory, you don't have neither present, nor past, nor future. So uh, when coming back to the title, remembering is a necessary ceremony, is also to remember how so many ceremonies where memory is collected and, and revived have been indeed forbidden. I can rem remember, remind uh, uh, as how, for instance, um, most of, uh, of artistic and practices and um, spiritual practices have been forbidden by law. For instance, something like capoeira that everybody likes to perform today was until the mid twenties forbidden by law under the constitution of being imprisoned if performed. Um, the African religions such as Canoblé was forbidden by law uh, under the constitution that if performed, you would be imprisoned. So there's all these rituals um, from the names to the performances, to the storytellings, to the mythologies, uh, to the method methodologies. All these have been forbidden by law and all these produces memory. All these are forms of ceremony. Um, and this is very much what Antigona explores, um, explores this, um, the necessity to start 
telling, retelling and revising history, revising which stories have been told, how they have been told, where they have been told and told by whom, and how important it is to tell them correctly and properly, um, and like a burial, like a, a dignifying burial. Um, otherwise, history becomes this ghost that keeps interrupting our present. Um, and otherwise, the barbarity of the past uh, repeats itself as well. So I, this is very much in this frame of timelessness that I like to work um, with all these different uh, um, terms of remembering, ceremony, performance, ritual, memory, forgetting, politics of erasure, conscious, unconscious, um, visible, invisible, and then to restage it. Um, I, I go back a little bit. I would like to show you one little clip. I hope it comes. How, for instance, in we end, I ended the story of Oedipus, who was, Oedipus means the one with a rep ankles because he, his body his, and his feet were wrapped um, and the child was brought to die uh, with the, the, the ankles uh, wrapped and Oedipus means the swollen an uh, ankles and I just wanted to show you this little part excerpt how then the music and the staging and the choreography comes to speak of, um, of the politics of violence and um, the need to liberate of the liberation of this, this, this politics. So I just put it on, I hope it works. This is a little excerpt um, with an ensemble of actors I always work with. Uh, we have been working together since, um, I don't know, maybe more than 12 uh, years. And these are all theater actors, German, uh, in the German theaters. Um, and the music uh, that you heard as well composed um, for each um, film. It's composed one single music and this music then I added and the same music is played and on one in excerpts of only the drumming or only the piano or only the voice or the entire piece then um, accompany the, the, the piece 
And I thought I, I would like to also to, to just to give an idea of also how I work. We have this very special um, studio. It's a studio that is like a skateboarding a studio with round, um, with round walls, uh, all painted in white, which gives this illusion of infinity. Uh, and this illusion of white infinity is very um, uh, powerful for me because it allows me to work with this idea of timelessness, of this matrix. And I think I like to, 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 I like to, to um, change time and space and to create, I think to, to create magic, you, you, you manipulate time and change and space, uh, uh, space and time and place. And I think this, this scenario allows that. Um, and then, as you see, I work with very, in a very naked um, uh, scenario, which sometimes it's quite scary to tell a story for one hour in the emptiness with only one actor or two actresses uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the scene. And I go from scene to scene and from conflict to conflict, uh, one by one, as if you are reading a book and you are reading a chapter after chapter. And, um, and then usually we, are, we have no shoes, we are, uh, our, we are barefoot uh, and we are dressed in black. Uh, the actors come with very simple, comfortable clothes. And then I dress them with some dozens of meters of fabric that I buy. As you see, this, uh, I go to the market and I buy uh, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of fabric and I cut it with scissors and I dress them and this is how I compose then the scenarios. In the video you saw that was not fabric, that was paper. So it's very simple, very uh, materials. Um, and why I think because I want in the first place that the uh, audience listens to the story and looks at the actors and acknowledges these bodies and these faces and are really engaged with the storyteller and with, and the, with the protagonists of the story and are not so bombarded with a lot of, 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 of uh, information, but that they go into this almost unconscious world, into this language of the unconscious and dive and leave the story and identify with the characters and, um, and feel with the characters. So um, the characters are um, the most important in the storytelling. So here, for instance, is Antigona. I work a lot with, with, um, with uh, air politics and the air style. I love doing the research and having very simple materials like just uh, wings and what is in the studio and to use it. Uh, this is the Sphinx and the, um, and this is, uh, I, it's good that it came. This is another protagonist, Ammon, who is the son of King Creon. Uh, when he knows that the father has decided to kill, um, uh, the bride Antigona. For Antigona, all the characters are um, uh, women actors, actresses, um, and I, I think I like to 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 go beyond this normativity um, of what the audience is expecting to see. It's very um, beautiful to tell a classic story and to change the characters um, and to tell the story with this intensity. And um, in this case here is Ammon, uh, played by uh, Amanda, um, and uh, Neil Moyanga is 
playing the piano. And this is a moment, an excerpt that shows the moment she knows um, a bride was killed by her own father. So just let it play. of course the father um, in uh, regretting the so many deaths that he caused so it's um, it brings this very political dimension of um, the king uh, realizing that power was more much more important than humanity and regretting so um, this is a story of Antigone um, I don't know how we are on time, but I just continue. I don't know, Omar and uh, Leslie, if you want to join before I go to the next one. Um, here is again um, the two brothers who, who jump and fight until death, and the sisters, Antigna and his men. Um, facing um, the deaths. When I created uh, Illusions Volume 2, Adipus was also particular, very important for me. It was for the Berlin Biennale, while Narcissus was for the Biennale of Sao Paulo. And the Berlin Biennale was also a time in 2018 when um, a poli a police brutality and um, was started become, becoming even more present. I was very busy with this question of, of the performance of violence and the desire to kill the black bodies um, and, um, and how um, violence and aggression becomes performed uh, in marginal bodies uh, repeatedly. So that's very much what is the work is about. Um, he is Amon again, um, and then starts the next project. Omar, uh, Leslie, would you like to, or should I continue to the next it's one? Probably better that you continue and then we I continue. We join you okay. after, yeah. Right, so I just continue just to give you an idea. So uh, Antigna really started bringing to me questions of ceremony and of um, realizing that great part of how history has not been told properly, is not archived or um, shown in public spaces. Um, and that actually we are dealing with a collective trauma to which we do not have symbols or vocabulary both visual and semantic, to tell the story, our history properly. And that is an immense work for a new generation of people who grew up, I think I grew up without a language actually to explain my reality. And I realized that to tell the stories that I want to tell today, the language that was given to me cannot, um, does, do not allow me to tell the stories that I want to tell. Definitely, we have to be very experimental and we have to have this freedom to experiment and to work in laboratory to find out a new vocabulary, both semantic and visual. Um, and um, 
from Antigona and the story of Antigona who challenges uh, this patriarchal and colonial uh, status quo and says, I have to go beyond a man and I have to obey and I have to see what is the law of humanity and the law of gods. Burial is necessary. I have to bury my brother in order to have memory. And only with memory I have present and future. Uh, it's something that Mark knew very much and it was the beginning to this uh, next work. Uh, it's a, a public, it's a large scale um, um, sculpture, uh, sculpture installation. It started first with an invitation from uh, the city of Lisbon who invited five artists to develop a work for a memorial for slavery. And I developed this one. Um, and um, and uh, this work didn't win, which is actually um, quite lucky because that at the same time allowed me to create what I created now in other terms, with other materials and in, other, in another frame. I realized this work is a, is, a, is a very feminist work for public space, not only because public spaces, women usually, women artists do not have works in public spaces, but then the work uh, doesn't go with many of the, um, of the conditions that were um, asked for, as for instance, um, that is a work that you don't see from far. Uh, it is not a phallic work, a follows that you see from, from far away in, in highs. It's a very discreet work that from above you see a boat, but when you enter the boat, you smell it and you, and you touch it and you have a different experience you need a certain intimacy. So I wanted to create this garden of contemplation or garden of lamentation to remember uh, this history that um, is a history of five, more than 500 years, but that you and go from city to city in Europe and globally, uh, knowing that the European project of slavery um, took several centuries and the European project of colonialism took several centuries and there you are crossing the world and seeing so many monuments and artworks in public space that never mention or show this part of history. And again, I was busy with, um, with what we see, the invisible and invisible and this politics of Eurasia. Uh, very in Lisbon, there's along the river many monuments dedicated to um, what uh, is still often called discoveries. And I was very busy how infantile the vocabulary we have is. We believe in things like discovery, discoverments, discoveries, knowing that a continent with millions of people cannot be discovered. We use words like slave as if slave is a natural condition without implicating and questioning that it is a system that is very carefully thought through to enslave people, um, to place people outside the human condition. So I was busy with all these semantic and visual images uh, that appears the glorification of the times and is very metaphorically presented through about so I created this boat in the sense of we you show and glorify um, the top of the boat. Uh, my question was, so who were, who were inside these boats and what these boats were carrying at the bottom? So um, the result is, um, is a, a very, detailed um, the display of how African people were displayed in the bottom of these boats and carried as cargo and sold 
and carried and transported to the other side of the Atlantic. Um, to create this, first I worked with clay and then from clay with burned wood. We went to a place in South Portugal and this is a very beautiful process. Again, a ceremony, a performance itself. So these uh, pieces of wood, these are woods that were reused um, from um, other projects that uh, didn't use this uh, wood anymore. So we will use these, um, these 25 centimeters to 25, 90 long uh, pieces of wood. And the process is a very beautiful one. You dig two walls, uh, two holes on the, on the soil, one with fire and one with water. And the wood goes through a process of fire. And after the fire is put on water and dried, and this goes through this process several times. So there's this process of fire, water, hair, death, life. And what happens is something very beautiful that each one of these pieces becomes very unique. And uh, the wood that was simply wood then suddenly has a different finger, fingerprint, just like a human being. And it's actually something you feel almost or literally like crying, I did, when, you, when the wood comes out, it really looks unique, like, um, like, like the skin of a person. Um, it, it's, it, it looks like scars, it looks like wounds, it looks like fingerprints, it looks like skin. It's a very strong um, 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 image and and it smells very strongly so once i we will this i wrote a poem i will come to it um and this poem was engraved in each one of these um these uh, blocks here you are. Oh, um, we were we engraved the poem. I I, I wrote a poem of seven, eighteen verses, and then went through this very beautiful process of going around the world searching for people who could translate a poem in several African languages, which sometimes was quite difficult to find. Um, because again, because of the politics of Eurasia, many of the languages, especially in the countries that were colonized by the Portuguese, really became forbidden. So people could, some people could speak a little bit, but did not know how to write or had to find an uncle or a grandfather who, to help out. So we started at the beginning, the first sentence is in Yoruba, which was quite easy to find. Uh, then in Kimbundu, which is a language, one of the most important languages in uh, Angola. Then in Criolo from Cabo Verde. Then in Portuguese, then in English. This one is not ready. We were painting and, and photographing affection is missing, and then in Arabic. So um, then I, it was designed so that it's, it can be engraved in each one of the, of the woods and then painted in gold with a syringe because it's so minimal. I, I think it has about three millimeters. So we had to paint everything. It took several days to paint it very delicately. And uh, so it can be read. So there's this, again, this timelessness of the past and the present. Also, Arabic was very important, especially uh, in the human crisis um, and these boats that now really are um, coming from crossing the Mediterranean Sea to Europe is something very present that continues the boats now come from south to north. And, um, and this is very much what I wanted to create. Then I wanted, I created a performance 
to uh, inaugurate, to open this, um, this um, large sculpture, which is 32 meters long in front of the river. And I wanted to work with uh, local artists from the African diasporas who grew up in the periphery, just like me. And um, so I put together an choir of, of uh, extremely talented people, a choir of uh, 16 voices from sopranos to bass. Um, um, most of them belong to the Gospel Collective, which is a, a collective from different people from the diaspora who come together and sing. Very, I, I was very lucky to work with such wonderful, talented people. Um, and then with two ballet dancers and with four percussionists, all of them so extraordinary. Uh, most of them people while working during the day, doing their job, and then in the evening are dedicated to their own art. Um, and I created this ensemble and in four days I put together, I, as I said before, I, I write the performance and the poem. This becomes, um, we, start, we started working with, uh, with the music composition with Kalafe Palanga and his team. We started putting voices together and then I started doing the storyboard and the images. And once I was in Lisbon, in four days, I work really in laboratory, experimental with the ensemble, and I create one scene after the other. And that was amazing, beautifully. So I go from the beginning. So this is uh, a little bit, some images of the performance. Here's Kalaf, here is Emily, one of the ballet dancers, me. Um, uh, Davi and the choir, they are um, the ballet dancers. I want to play a little bit some of the choirs for you here because it might just cannot show you how powerful the voices are. And they're almost done. This is just a little excerpt, remembering that most of the performance is actually kind of operetta performance where voice becomes very, very uh, dominant. Um, so in most of the scenes comes these very powerful voices or the drumming uh, or the poem that I wrote, recited or sung. Oh, this is back, this is the beginning when we were doing the production of the wood and painting. And this, are, this is how the poem looked like. It's uh, very beautifully shining. And when you pass by the river, you see this large road with something shining. And, and then um, the verses come in a kind of a playful way where one word leads to the next and is next to the next. So one oblivion, one wound, uh, one wound, one death, one death, one sorrow, one sorrow, and so on. And um, and this is a choir, this beautiful people and talented. Um, and um, and these are the percussionist, this is a beautiful young 15 year old percussionist who came with a father. It's a very, a very important percussionist, Nick Trovoada. And um, so I'm just showing you a little bit. This is how the boat looks like just in front of the river, ready to leave or just arrived. And the dance. Uh, the recitation of the poem that was 
with voices and singing, um, the performers, the boat, the percussionists, and the front had two women percussionists, Onashi and Martinika, Jair and Nick, incredible artists. So it was very important for me to come to Lisbon where I only, I, that's where I was born and where I grew up and I only show, it was the second time I showed my work in Lisbon. My work is quite anonymous there. I think most of black artists have serious difficulties to have a platform to show the work. So it was very important for me to open this platform and to create a collective work where many people from the periphery have visibility. And it was just magical. I'm going to show you um, a trailer. Oh, I forgot to say, of course, you see here Matt and Boca. Um, the boat was created in the frame of Boca, the biennial of contemporary arts in Lisbon, who had the vision of bringing uh, this piece there and the courage, as well as Matt, is the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology. And uh, with collaboration with Ejiak and Kunst, uh, Alla Baden Baden, Artworks, there were several people collaborating. And this is one of the tools. Yes, so um, I said so much. What do you think, Mama? Should I continue speaking? Or do you want to join me? <laughs> <laughs>